Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Rick Dina, and the purpose of today's video is to show my personal case history with raw cruciferous vegetable consumption and the function of my thyroid gland. Now the reason for this video is that there are many people out there that will tell you that raw cruciferous vegetables, things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, bok choy, kale, collards, etc., are not good foods to eat because they can actually damage your thyroid gland. Specifically, they say they can block the uptake of iodine and your thyroid gland needs iodine in order to function properly. So for the last 25 or so years, I have been consuming very large quantities of raw cruciferous vegetables. Most days of the year, most nights of my life, I eat one head of cauliflower in my evening salad. And I've been doing that for over 25 years now. I also typically each day make a green smoothie, or at least several times a week, that includes either some collard leaves or some kale leaves in there. So that's an additional significant source of raw cruciferous vegetables. So I thought it would be interesting to see if my thyroid gland was actually healthy given that I consume so many of these foods that so many people say damage your thyroid gland. And more specifically, they'll say that because these raw cruciferous vegetables block iodine uptake, that then your thyroid gland won't have enough iodine to produce it, the two primary hormones that it makes, T3 and T4, and therefore you're gonna get low thyroid function, which can lead to a number of problems. Here's just an extra picture of our refrigerator. Five heads of cauliflower a week times a year, times 52, is about 300 heads per year. And 300 heads a year, 3,000 heads a decade, that would be 6,000 heads over 20 years, and that adds up to about 8,000 heads of raw cauliflower that I've consumed over the last 25 years or so. There are times during the year when I may be doing a juice fast, and for a week or two I might not be consuming any cauliflower at all. Although normally if I'm doing that, I'm consuming larger than normal amounts of collards and kale in the green juices. That's a lot of cauliflower in addition to other raw cruciferous vegetables. So let's go ahead and see and try to determine if my thyroid gland is actually functioning properly. Two of the best tools that we have to determine thyroid function as well as other things is a personal case history compared to what the symptoms of an issue may be. So we're gonna look at that first. And then secondarily, we're gonna look at one of my favorites. We're gonna look at a recent laboratory profile I had done on my thyroid function. Because a lot of times with lab work, you can look at what's going on and sometimes you can predict a problem years or even decades before it actually happens. And by knowing that far in advance, you can correct the course and then retest and follow up to see if you're on the right track now to not have a problem instead of staying on the track to see if you do have a problem. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the various symptoms that can occur when you are suffering from hypothyroid, meaning low thyroid function. First one is low energy or fatigue. And I'm happy to say I don't experience that with any regularity. Several nights in a row, I haven't gotten enough sleep. You know, sure, I'll be dragging a little bit, but not normally. Brain fog. Luckily, I'm not experiencing that either. I teach science of raw food nutrition classes. I research a lot. I make sense out of scientific things and explain it to people in ways that they understand. So I think my brain's not too foggy. It's working quite well. Oh, sorry, forgot. Cross off fatigue, cross off brain fog. Got a little foggy there for a moment. Okay, how about depression? Not suffering from depression, that would be a pain. Uh, weight gain, you know, I'm pretty lean here, so I'm not gaining weight. Of course, I eat a healthy diet, but um, even if you eat a healthy diet, if your thyroid functions low enough, it's real easy to gain weight. 
You can have high cholesterol if you have low thyroid function. So with hypothyroid function, people typically have increased cholesterol. Another thing you can sort of predict and take a look at with lab work, as long as you put it together with other things and actually know what you're looking at, that's the key. So my cholesterol, as it turns out, is actually pretty low. I'm gonna have an upcoming video on a recent cardio metabolic profile that I had done. Some people may claim my cholesterol is even too low. So we can safely say I don't have high cholesterol. And when your thyroid gland is low and it's not cranking up your metabolism, you get kind of cold because your metabolism slows down. That's why you gain weight. That's why you don't have much energy. So you're kind of cold. And then if you add a cold temperature on top of that, that'll really put you over the edge and you'll be uncomfortable. So you'll have sensitivity to cold. I don't experience that at all. So luckily, I don't have any of these major hypothyroid symptoms. There's a number of other symptoms that can go along with a sluggish thyroid as well. And to see the computer screen in front of me, I got to sport my new glasses, which are actually weaker than my old glasses as part of my program to try to ultimately get rid of these and have uh, vision like I used to without them. So what else can happen when your thyroid gland is sluggish, when you have hypothyroidism? You can have anxiety and panic attacks. Luckily, I'm not experiencing any of that. You can have brittle nails. And actually, when I was a kid, my nails were breaking all the time. I always had a hang nail, a little piece of nail breaking off or something and then hanging down. Um, once I changed my diet to eat a lot more vegetables, including a lot more raw cruciferous vegetables, I noticed immediately that my nails started getting much stronger and they haven't broken since I've been about 19 years old. So my nails are doing great. Constipation, not having that. Again, everything slows down. Decreased memory, depression, fluid retention, pre-tibial edema, not having that, headaches, migraines, inability to concentrate, menstrual irregularities. Now that proves it. I don't have any menstrual irregularities, so my thyroid gland must be great. All right, a rough or dry skin, no, I don't have that. Slow reflexes, poor circulation, slow speech. Poor concentration, muscle and joint pain, slow heart rate, slow movements, morning stiffness, loss of hair from legs, armpits, arms, thinning eyelashes, and loss of one-third of your eyebrows. Apparently, you can lose a lot of hair with low thyroid function. And I don't have quite as much hair on the bottom of my legs as I did maybe 20 years ago, but um, I've got it all in my eyebrows and eyelashes and on, the, on, the, on my... Uh, on my arms and armpits, you know, normal amount of hair. Um, let's see, itchy, dry, scaly ear canals or excess of earwax. Luckily, I'm not dealing with that. And hair loss in the front or the back of the head. All right, well, they got me on that a little bit. My forehead is a bit higher than it was, say, 20 years ago, and I don't quite have all my hair in the back here anymore either. Now, once you get to your mid to upper 40s and your male, it's not at all unusual. Essentially, for all practical purposes, I am not experiencing any symptoms of a low thyroid. So let's take a look at some lab work also. A few months back, I had a thyroid panel done by ZRT Laboratories, one of the labs that I utilize in my laboratory analysis consulting practice. And so what I did is I had some basic thyroid stuff done. I had vitamin D tested as well. I'm getting a series of vitamin D tests done, and I'm going to have an upcoming episode on that as well to see my experimentation with a particular form of supplementation. So these numbers aren't that big. So to help make them easier to see, I've put them up here. So what you see here is exactly what's here, but bigger. So what did they test with this panel? They tested, first of all, T4, free T4. So T4 is the primary hormone that the thyroid gland produces. It's got a couple of tyrosine rings, and then it has four iodines attached to it. That's why they call it T4. Some of you like to know the technical details. The iodines 
are in the three and the five and the three prime and the five prime positions on the tyrosine rings. So that is the primary product that your thyroid gland produces. And you need enough of that. I've got plenty of that and that's good to see. The thyroid gland also makes T3. Now T4 is the primary product of the thyroid gland. It also makes T3. However, most of the T3 that you see in your blood has been converted to T3 from T4 by your peripheral tissues, mostly by your liver and your kidney. So if you see enough T3, you know your thyroid's working well, you know your liver and kidneys are working well, you know that you also have enough of the mineral selenium because five prime deiodinase that takes that iodine off of T4, converting it into T3. And you really need enough T3 because T3 is four to five times more metabolically active than T4. It is the primary hormone that gets your metabolism going. So I'm right dialed in for that as well. Now, those two by themselves don't tell you everything. There's lots of other things to test on a thyroid panel. There's TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, which we tested here. You can also test total T4, total T3, reverse T3, and you can test various thyroid antibodies. So um, those can be on the panel, as well as T3 uptake. So the thing is, we could have done a more extensive panel, but these three things give you a really good basic foundation of what's going on with your thyroid. Now, let's just say you tested those two and they looked great, but your TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone level, was elevated. What that tells you is it means that your thyroid's getting a little sluggish and your body makes more of the stimulating hormone in order to crack the whip on the thyroid. So that would be an indicator if TSH was elevated, but your thyroid hormones were okay, that would mean you're heading toward hypothyroidism. Some might call that subclinical hypothyroidism. So you, in general, you want your TSH to be lower, not too high. Reference range here is 0.5 to 3.0. I'm at 0.9. Now, a typical medical reference range goes up to 4 or 5, sometimes even 5.5. And various endocrinology groups have realized that if you're at 3.5, that's not really ideal, that your thyroid is a little bit sluggish and you're having to make some extra TSH. So I'm good and low at 0.9. In fact, that brings up a good point. If you look at the typical medical reference ranges of too low and too high, you know, they basically think anything in there is okay, and then as soon as you go outside, all of a sudden you have pathology. The thing is, it all happens on a spectrum. Oftentimes, you can take that gross pathology range and you can narrow it down a lot more into optimal functioning. And even if you consider the really narrow, optimized function levels, of free T4, free T3, and TSH. My levels are all really dialed in. They also looked at thyroid peroxidase. That gets a little more complicated. Uh, you want that to be good and low. I am good and low. So in any case, I am not experiencing any symptoms of hypothyroidism. My recent thyroid panel, which is a decent panel, not everything, but it's a pretty good comprehensive panel, at the basic function is optimal, very much dialed in into the optimum ranges for each of these three indicators. So you can tell a lot by these three numbers about your thyroid function, about your iodine status in your body, about the selenium status in your body, as I mentioned previously. Now, if you measured individual nutrient levels, like iodine or selenium on their own, you sometimes get a different picture. And the nice thing about this is this is a functional assessment 
of iodine and selenium. So despite consuming what most people would consider large, large quantities of raw cruciferous vegetables for pushing 30 years now, my thyroid function is optimal. Now, one case history doesn't tell you everything. May there be some circumstances where you need to limit your raw cruciferous vegetable intake? Yes, there may be. But because of those, should we say that raw cruciferous vegetables are bad for you and they're bad for everybody, and if you eat enough of them, it's just a matter of time before you get a thyroid problem? Can you say that? Like a lot of people making outrageous claims out there because a little bit of information is dangerous? And the answer is no, you cannot. Okay, I know I'm only one case, but 27 years with large quantities of raw cruciferous vegetables, optimum thyroid function. Okay, so you can't make a blanket statement. And that's one of the beauties of lab work as long as you have someone who really knows what they're looking at. You can test yourself to see if everything's working the way it should or not. That's one of the things I love about my consulting practice where I analyze people's lab work, talk to them about the results. If everything looks good, great. If it doesn't, then we make some changes and we follow up to make sure we're on the right track. So I hope you all enjoyed this presentation about raw cruciferous vegetables. And in the future, I'm going to make other videos about this topic, look at different aspects of things, so stay tuned. Thank you very much.